on today's podcast. Talk about insulin resistance prediabetes. I hate the term insulin resistance. I think it negatively triggers, and I think it, it triggers me, I guess. If that's the term of the day, right? It's a, but glucose, like insulin's not doing anything wrong, right? There's one hormone to lower glucose and four hormones to raise it, right? So we're blaming insulin for not doing a job. And really to get glucose into a cell requires what? Glucose transporters for the most part. And guess what? They're all T3 dependent. So if you don't have sufficient levels of T3 in the cell, you're not gonna get glucose into a cell. If you're a healthcare provider tired of just treating symptoms and ready to dig deeper into the root causes of health issues, the Vibrant Wellness Podcast is for you. With insider tips, expert interviews, and the latest in biotech research, this podcast will take your patient care to the next level. Hey there, Vibrant listeners. It is Jen Rivas here, your co-host with the incredible Dr. Emmy Brown, as always. And today we're going to talk about a fairly common occurrence. A new patient walks in your door, and despite all the medical advice, treatments, normal labs, they feel to their core that something just isn't right. That's the exhaustion, the weight gain, the hair loss, and all those overwhelming feelings of anxiety and depression that you know aren't just in your head. Our esteemed guest today, Dr. Eric Balkovich, is here to shed light on what he calls the thyroid de debacle. In his groundbreaking book, he delves deep into the misconceptions surrounding thyroid disorders. He challenges the age-old belief that thyroid disorders are primarily a result of a dysfunctional thyroid gland. Instead, he presents a revolutionary perspective, suggesting that the real issue often lies in the functioning of our cells and not just the thyroid gland. So Dr. Balkovich is an expert in this field. So if you are searching for answers for yourself or for your patients, today's episode is a must listen. Let's welcome Dr. B to the podcast. How are you, Dr. B? I'm doing great. I feel like I owe you like 50 bucks for that present that <laughs> hey, introduction. I've so. got Venmo, Zelle, whichever way you want to send it. <laughs> I don't have any of those. So we'll just, we'll just, we'll take it on credit. How's that? There we go. But I appreciate you guys having me on the podcast. I think we'll, I think we'll have some fun. I think so too. I am excited, Dr. B, because you talk about the thyroid in a way I have not read or heard before. Um, before we get into that nitty gritty, please tell our listeners, how did you come to functional medicine and medicine in general? You know, was it something from a little age, from a young age or how did you get here? So I had really no intent in, in being in medicine and functional medicine specifically. Um, funny story is the reason I'm in it is uh, I was hurt in a car accident, had to transfer colleges, wound up going to uh, a local state school uh, mid-year. And uh, I was a business major and I couldn't get any business classes because it was like mid-year. So there was like, this, you needed to start, you know, get those classes started a year. And, so I asked the person who is designated as my advisor, like, what major does nobody take? <laughs> and they said, medical technology. I'm like, perfect. I'll just take to that. get That's classes. What, just that to get my classes. Great. They're like, do you even know what it is? I'm like, no, it doesn't matter. Just give me that. <laughs> Sign me up. And so um, I had already been in, in the, the time I was off, I had actually taken on a job in the OR as, a, as an instrument tech to pay for my way through school and my bills and stuff. And so I was like, well, you know, I mean, you're, you know, how bad could it be? Um, and so I started doing that major. And then I thought as I went through that, I was like, all right, I'm working in the hospital and I, I see what's going on. Um, maybe I'll just be, I'll go to med school. So I, my game plan at that was really, I'll go to med school and I got, um, because of the car accident that I had been in, I had stopped playing rugby, and I met a guy who said, "Hey, I'm, you should come play rugby for me." And I'm like, "I can barely walk, you know." I'm like, "Who are you?" He's like, "I'm Doc Jones. I'm the local chiropractor." I'm like, "Oh, you're a witch doctor," <laughs> and uh, he was like, instead of instead of pummeling me, he just said, "Like, tell me what you've done so far." And I'd done all the traditional things in medicine, you know, physical therapy and all this stuff, and I just was struggling. And uh, he said, I'll make you a deal. If you come see me um, and I get you better, you have to play for me. If I, if I can't get you better, you don't owe me anything. So I was like, man, I don't know anything about it. All I know is what my family would always say. They're all a bunch of witch doctors. And, um, and so I called home to check on my mom with my mom, who's a nurse. And my father got, he was like, she's not home. What do you need? And I told him, and he's like, uh, I forbid you to go see him. Oh, wow. So I made an appointment on Monday. And... Um, <laughs> You know, I wound up, he winds up helping me within a couple of months. I'm back, I'm, I'm back playing rugby. I finished school. I th I'm going to take my MCATs. And he gave me, uh, he said to me, 
you're, you're going to go to chiropractic school. And I'm like, why would I go to chiropractic school? And he said, uh, well, how's your sinuses? How's your headaches? How's your back? How's all this stuff? And I was like, man, you know what? I don't, I don't have any of that stuff anymore. He said, why do you think that is? I'm like, I don't know, clean living. And he's like, Eric, you're going to school full time. You're working full time, playing rugby and you drink like a fish. So it's not clean living. Read these books. Don't come back and see me until um, you've gone through them. And I devoured those in, in, in less than a week. And so it was all these green books and stuff. And I was like, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. It's different than what I'm doing work-wise, but this is, it helped me. Maybe it can, maybe this is a, a path. And it did pay off that I was getting some money to play rugby and help offset the costs and all that stuff sounded good. So I, I went to school, became a chiropractor, came out of school, and I had no intention of doing any functional medicine. I thought I left the medicine and labs and stool tests, you know, all the Petri dish stuff behind. And I got a, a, a call from my brother one day. It's like, hey, his, his wife had, was diagnosed with problems, a thyroid disorder, a fibroid, and iron deficiency. And they you know, essentially said, we're going to put you on thyroid medications, hysterectomy, and iron for the rest of your life. And I'm like, well, what? Why, why are you calling me? I mean, it's, there's not, I don't have an adjustment for that, right? Yeah. There's nothing I'm going to do here. And he's like, no, but you're going to help figure it out. And so that started me on that journey where I went back to my blood chemistry and started looking at things. And then I needed help. And I, I started doing apex seminars and following the teeth Karazian and realized, okay, this is immune. It's an autoimmune disorder. And I, all this stuff must tie together somehow. And so long story short, that I was really got into this to help my brother and help my sister-in-law. But then as I talked to my chiropractic patients, I realized that, you know, you make this kind of small talk while you're helping them and, and everybody's, all these people are on thyroid medication. And I'm asking this question, like, 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 how do you feel though? And nobody felt good. Hmm. So then that led to more study, more time with the T's, more seminars, more stuff. And then eventually I just kind of, this became the thing instead of doing more chiropractic stuff, more functional medicine and we, and that became the past. But I was still treating, I think, even from a functional medicine perspective, I was still treating people like I learned under Detis and, and some of the other functional medicine training. This is this immune system out of control. You know, people don't convert well. Um, you know, some people need T4 and T3. And I just was struggling with the whole concept. And a, a friend of mine, um, Dr. Ben Lynch, we were prepping up for one of his ShyCon conferences. And, and uh, he's, and we had been doing a bit of work together. And he said, Eric, you, you need to read this paper. And the paper was on the cell danger response uh, by Dr. Robert Navio. And when I read that paper, I was like, man, this is what I've been looking for. I realized that something was wrong with the way we were treating people. We're trying to manipulate labs with different medications. We're saying the immune system's out of control. I just had a hard time with it. But then when I read Navio's paper, that's when the aha moment came. And I was like, man, maybe what we're seeing here in thyroid physiology isn't broken physiology. It's adaptive physiology. And the reason people don't feel good is we try and fix their thyroid physiology is because the thyroid physiology is not broken. We're forcing a whole bunch of thyroid hormone into a system that may not want it at all. And I reached out to Dr. Navio just because just I read the paper and I'm looking at, hey, these micronutrients do this under homeostasis and this under allostasis. And there was no thyroid hormone in this paper. And I was like, so I said, what, what about thyroid hormone? You missed that in here. And he's like, Eric, Eric I don't know much about mm -hmm. thyroid physiology. And I'm like, oh my gosh, how could you not know? Right? Because I'm coming from this, you know, intense thyroid model. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when my, my friend Ben said, you know, you need to, you're going to have to write a book to explain it. And I put it off for a, a bunch of years. And then finally, Ben was like, you need to get it done. And so that led to the book getting done. But it's been the philosophy of how I really look at people. I, I, I'm kind of never trying to manipulate thyroid physiology directly. I don't think it's, in most cases, I don't think it's broken. I think it's adaptive. I think it's the result of some type of excessive cell stress response. And what I've seen in 28 years, if we evaluate the person and they're trying to identify what's creating that excessive stress response on the cells and tissues, then and we reduce or remove it, then the cells and tissues can start to recover. And not only do they start to recover, but they convert T4 to T3 better. We see a redu reduction in the thyroiditis. We see a gland recover. 
and we can see people needing less and less medication. It works better. And in a lot of my clients in time, they don't need it at all because their physiology has been restored. So it's, it's, been, a, it's been a ride. It's been a great journey. Um, and I love what I'm doing, but I don't even know if I'm all right. You know what I mean? Because I, every time you think sure. you've got it figured out, um, we find out, nope, that's not how things work. Yeah. But I do think it's a better strategy than even than the functional medicine model I had practiced in the early in the early years. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that that honesty and that journey. What a beautiful kind of twist and turn to to how you got here. And we are going to dive deep into thyroid and your book. But I want to pull back just a little bit and I'd love to ask you just the question like, where do you feel that conventional medicine misses? when it comes to thyroid health? So I think the biggest problem with allopathic treatment of thyroid physiology is the assumption that everybody's in homeostasis and that the gland, if, you, if, is, if, the, gl if the gland makes appropriate levels of thyroid hormone, it's got to get into the blood, into the blood. It's got to get into the cells. It's always going to convert to T3 and everything's going to be kumbaya, right? And so they look at the physiology, say the immune system's out of control. It's damaging the gland. It's an autoimmune condition. There's nothing we're going to do, but that doesn't matter. All we have to do is put thyroid hormone in the system. It's got to work the way we want it to. And I think it's naive. I think it's reductionistic. It doesn't consider what's happening in the, in the bloodstream. It doesn't ha consider what's happening with the transport of hormones into the, into the cell. And it totally disregards what's happening in the cells and tissues that can all regulate themselves independently of each other to some degree and independent of the thyroid gland. It's like saying, if you send your child to their room to clean it, they're going to clean it. <laughs> and I don't know if you guys have kids. I've had three, you know, and there's all kinds of times when you tell your kid to do something with the, and they, the intention is right. And you go up there and nothing's done, right? It's not that So simple. it doesn't always work out, right? I feel great that on point. A deep level. Good analogy. <laughs> and I will say this: that, you know, we we in function in the functional space are. I, I think I have an argument that, or, or disagreement with sometimes how we eva evaluate and address it from a from a functional medicine perspective. And I think sometimes we don't give the medical community credit because we say they don't realize that what's going on with the thyroid gland is that it's, that it's an immune driven disorder. It's, and we say, oh, they didn't run antibodies. I think the vast majority of allopathic physicians realize it's an immune-driven condition. They're just not going to do anything for it. And then we say, well, they only check TSH and a reflex to T4, maybe only a TSH, and that's, that's inappropriate. Well, if the premise is that the immune system is damaging the gland, it's going to destroy it anyway, and there's nothing we can do, then you only need, and, 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 the, and the treatment is only T4, then yeah, you only really need to measure TSH, wait till it becomes lab high, check T4. If it's low, then you give T4 to restore TSH. So I just think that's the model. I don't think they're it's bad people. I just think it's that's what the model is. So they're following it. Yeah. And the argument when you look at the literature is maybe we should give thyroid hormones sooner. And I don't think that's a good idea either in many cases. Um, because if you give thyroid hormone when, when the body, if, if my theory is correct, my hypothesis is correct, that a lot of these people giving them thyroid hormone too soon is going to suppress thyroid function, may upregulate the sympathetic nervous system and reduce peripheral conversion anyway. Mm -hmm. So I think we just have to realize they just do something different than we do. And not everybody wants what we do. So for the person who just wants a medication, doesn't want to have to change anything about their diet or lifestyle, it's probably the best treatment. I don't know. Yeah. Right. Very fair and reasonable. And and I really want to get into the nitty the nitty gritty in terms of these terms you're using. So uh, Dr. B, I, and I've read somewhere, you mentioned this was a staggering statistic. By the time a true glandular disorder presents itself, the literature indicates that greater than 90% of the thyroid gland function has been lost. Absolutely, um, yep. So how are you assessing thyroid dysfunction before labs meet this di diagnostic criteria for hypothyroid, for example? So... I wish it was like one thing, right? But I look at a lot. And so you look at sure. health history, you look at health timeline, you look at signs and symptoms. And then when we look at labs, we have to, we have to look at, I look at a full thyroid panel 
And I typically, at least at the onset, I always look at a comprehensive metabolic panel with iron markers, with liver markers, with blood sugar markers, with renal markers. Because what I want to see is not just what thyroid panel shows, but I also want to see what the, what's the impact at the tissue level. So when we look at labs, I think we, we have to be careful because what, what happens in allopathic medicine is essentially, I think a lot of times it just gets red. Is it high or is it low? The physician may actually never even see the labs. Their assistant may just say, everything's good. There's no H's or L's. Mm -hmm. And in functional medicine, we see those silly medical doctors. They use these broad ranges, 95% of the population. It's, that's not good enough. We'll use an optimal range, narrow range, maybe 0.5 to one devi standard deviation away from the midline. And the problem with that is if we just use that range and say it's optimal, then we're trying to jam things into a certain reference range. And, and my, my issue is that we have to actually interpret the labs. And so we have to consider that a lab value like a TSH could be totally normal and appropriate. A TSH value could be normal and totally inappropriate mm -hmm. for the person who's sitting in front of me. Mm -hmm. and, this, and we could have a lab value that's abnormal. And we're like, Ab absolutely, this is awesome. And a patient is like, what do you mean it's abnormal? No, this is exactly appropriate. For you, you have hypothyroid signs and symptoms and the, value, and the labs show it. And then a lab value could be abnormal and totally inappropriate, right? Somebody says, hey, I'm so healthy. You should check my labs. And then you check their CRP and it's 45. And you're like, whoa, something's abnormal here, right? Maybe we got to get this person checked um, for something more sinister. But that, I think that becomes really important. So I always look at a thyroid, complete thyroid panel when I'm looking at the labs. And really what I want to look at is I want to look at all the values. They all matter. I know the trend today is just TSH and free hormones, but I look at everything because you, there's things that could create normal free values, but low totals. And so that's important. I think everything's important. So it all has to be interpreted. So we want to look at the total T4, total T3. We want to look at free T3 and free T4. And we want to look at the, the ratio of free T3 to free T4, which really tells the story. Is this a person who's in true tish, glandular and tissue hypothyroidism, meaning there's not enough thyroid hormone in the system. And what that happens in a true deficiency across the board, and that's the only thing that's really wrong is there's not enough thyroid hormone, you're going to see a really high free T3 to free T4 ratio because as fast as they're making T4, they're going to convert it to T3 because supporting T3 is a biologic priority. But if we see that the person's ratio is less than, and this is in, you know, in, in depending on what calculation you use. But if the ratio is less than 0 0.31, when you're looking at picomoles per, per, per milliliter or picomoles per liter, then you're looking at a person who's not converting T4 to T3. Mm -hmm. And so if they're not converting T4 to T3, then we have to ask yeah. the question, is more gonna work? If there's sufficient T4 in the system and T3 is low, then either they have a, a lot of people argue that everybody has deionase 2 polymorphisms and they can't convert T4 to T3. I don't think that's the, the primary issue for most people. I think it's more that defensive adaptive response. The body's not converting that T4 to T3 appropriately. And that's a person that is probably has cellular tissue hypothyroidism, but doesn't need the medication. So those are things I take a look at. We can also take a look at reverse T3. That may tell a story as well, but not the story we typically hear in functional medicine, which is reverse T3 blocks T3 from binding to receptors. They're mirror images. That's not true. Uh, or at least it's not been proven to be true, but it is functional lore and it gets too much press. And I, I'm probably I one of the louder voices arguing against it. And uh, I think I put it out there a bunch of times. If anybody wants to, to argue it or debate it, I'm more than willing to debate it. But... I haven't seen any science that really shows that that's the case. If we want to blind, blame anything for blocking T3 from binding receptors, let's talk about deiodinase 3, because that's really what's deactivating T4 and T3 to begin with. So I'll look at all of those things and I'll say, do we have a glandular thyroid condition or do we have really a tissue hypothyroid issue going on? And that's when then from there, I also want to take a look at those and say, okay, is this person on med? Are they on the wrong med? Too much med? Uh, and I, we can talk about that later. And then the second thing I do is just go look at the inflammatory markers. So I run at least seven inflammatory markers on my panel because if the person has inflammation, based on the literature, we know when a person has inflammation, they're going to, depending on the tissue, they're going to have favor the deactivation 
of thyroid hormone at the cell and tissue level. And at the brain, they're going to favor an increased conversion of T4 to T3 to a large degree. And so we can see TSH staying normal or relatively low, even though a person has hypothyroid signs and symptoms. And if you just ran the TSH, you wouldn't see they had a developing thyroid issue because the inflammation suppressing it. So I'll look for those. That helps me understand why, yep, uh, this person's probably got some type of cell stress response going on because those inflammatory chemicals are signaling molecules of, of cells in danger. And then I'll start looking at all the rest of the labs. What cells, tissues seem to be, and systems seem to be impacted by it? Do I have a blood sugar dysregulation pattern? We talk about glucose, talk about insulin resistance prediabetes. I hate the term insulin resistance. I think it negatively triggers, and I think it, it triggers me, I guess. If that's the term of the day, right? It's a, but glucose, like insulin's not doing anything wrong, right? There's one hormone to lower glucose and four hormones to raise it, right? So we're blaming insulin for not doing a job. And really to get glucose into a cell requires what? Glucose transporters for the most part. And guess what? They're all T3 dependent. So if you don't have sufficient levels of T3 in the cell, you're not going to get glucose into a cell. You're going to be glucose resistant. You're going to need more insulin. So I'll look for that, that pattern. I will look for elevated lipids because elevated lipids are a great sign that the mitochondria is not functioning well, probably because of decreased T3. Therefore, glucose that's coming into the cell can't be converted and driven into the mitochondria to make ATP. So it's coming back out of the cell as cholesterol. And now the body still doesn't have enough T3 at the liver, at the adrenal gland to pull it in and use it effectively. So that's why cholesterol builds up in the bloodstream. Then I'll look at the the renal markers. I'll look at liver markers. I'll look at each tissue type so I can get an understanding of what cells, tissues, systems seem to be impacted by this hypothyroidism. And then look for clues as to what might be triggering that hypothyroid state, that tissue hypothyroidism or that cell danger response. And those are the things I really want to attack and address. I don't want to try and fix it with a bunch of supplement, uh, thyroid hormone replacement, T4 or T3. I do want the person to have enough in the system, but I don't want them to have any more than they possibly need. I think way, way too many people are over-medicated. Dr. B, you just took me to school. <laughs> I, I often talk about how I'm not coming from a clinical background, but what you just explained, I mean, I imagine a lot of people just walked away with a lot of aha moments. So, wow, that's amazing. Do you consider yourself a detective when it comes to this stuff? Because I really feel like that's what it is. You just... I think we all. I think we all have to be yeah. a bit of a detective if we're going to be helping people. Um, I think one of the ch the things I talk about, and my co-author of the book, Dr. Kelly Hallerman, we talk about all the time, is you know principles over protocols, like like pathways over protocols, like mm. what's going on versus just slapping protocols. Protocols are great for the new practitioner coming out. And they learn, oh, you got they got a gut issue. Let me just do this. They have a thyroid issue. I'll give this. Yeah, it's great to get started. But none of that stuff really works for, for a lot of sick people. Mm -hmm. You have to understand the concepts that are going on. And I think that's what our strong suit should be, is trying to do more with less and trying to identify what's the mechanism of action that's causing this all to happen. How can I pull on this spider web and have the biggest impact on it versus just slapping a whole bunch of supplements into somebody's system yeah. and overwhelming them with supplements, which... I just call greenwashing of medicine, right? We, I, I can't tell you how many people show up and I'm sure you, you're more than aware of this. They come in with their shopping bags of supplements. Oh, yeah. I just had one <laughs> today. Who, she was taking 30 supplements. She's in this space and she was, she's taking 30 different, not capsules, 30 different bottles of supplements every day, plus wow. T4 and T3, plus estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. She's wow. like, this is I, like, why are you taking all this stuff? And they worked with somebody else who was trying to optimize their physiology. I'm like, if you need 30 supplements and all these meds to feel this crappy, you don't need any of them. <laughs> I'm like, I mean, it's not working. Still yeah. looking for help. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's truly functional medicine, what you're describing, Dr. B, in terms of that using nuance to look at all labs, look at labs from every body system. Um, and so I think that that's really eye-opening and profound and, and refreshing, to say the least. So uh, you touched on cellular hypothyroidism, and I think I have a sense of this, albeit very complicated. But you also mentioned thyroid allostasis. Can you mm -hmm. speak to that a bit more? 
Yeah. So homeostasis is a state where we make enough energy to do everything we want to do, right? But allostasis is a state where we're not making enough energy to do everything we need to do. And therefore we need to turn down the sum of the systems in the body, right? To conserve energy. Mm. And it, the analogy I typically use for clients is, let's say the power went out in your house and you want to, you still need to run the refrigerator and the freezer, right? So you get the generate, the gas power generator out of your garage and you plug it in and you can run the refrigerator and a couple lights. But now you want to get a hot shower. Well, I don't have enough power to get a hot shower. So I got unplugged the refrigerator, plug in the hot water heater. Now I can get a hot shower, but you know, I can't do a bunch of other things. And when cells are perceiving danger, it's typically because there's a drop in energy in, inside the cell, do it in toxicity, hypoxia, and inflammation, infection. And they're, they're going to downregulate their metabolism. And we look at that because it causes, causes us negative signs and symptoms. We think it's broken. And my argument is it's probably not broken, at least at the onset. And I, there's a, a really important piece of that is that we think about thyroid physiology and, and thyroid hormone and metabolism that T4 gets converted to T3, T3 binds to receptors inside the cells. It turns on the manufacturing process so we can make hair and skin and hormones and all this great stuff. But we don't think about what else T3 does in a cell. T3 in the cell also turns off some of these cell defense inflammatory mechanisms. So if I'm a cell and I'm in low stress homeostatic state, man, I want a lot of glucose. I want a lot of oxygen. I want a lot of T3 because I want to I make stuff, right? But if I've got a threat inside the cell, I don't want to keep increasing the metabolism. I don't want to bring more pro amino acids and make more peptides that that organism can use. I don't want to uh, increase nutrition into that cell that, some, that a threat could use. I want to stiffen the cell membranes. I want to reduce the oxygen. I want to ramp up the immune inflammatory system inside the cell so that I can find whatever that threat is and get rid of it. And a really important piece, and thyroid hormone plays a role in every aspect of the cell danger response, but one of the things that's really critical, because mitochondrial dysfunction is this kind of phrase we throw around all the time. Everybody's got mitochondrial dysfunction. We just need to give them this B-complex with magic supplements that are, are going to fix the mitochondria, which I think is, is just crazy talk. But allostasis is critical to helping support that cell defense. So if I reduce the conversion of T4 to T3, I turn off the manufacturing process. And with less T3 in the cell, I can turn on those cell defense mechanisms. And now I can defend myself. And this is, it's in the literature. I mean, this is not stuff I, you know, I kind of let me think about what I want to do. I mean, this is stuff that lots of time and looking at the literature to see it. And really significantly is the impact on mitochondrial function. Why would it be beneficial that if somebody's got cell stress that they would need a downregulation of the cellular, hyper, cellular thyroid state, this thyroid allostasis to occur? And the, res the reason is when we have a threat inside the cell, let's say there's an organism inside the cell, the cell is going to try to increase the free radicals to try and kill this thing. That's one of the tools to get it. Inside a cell, we have the ability to make oxidants and antioxidants. It's just the part of general exhaust, right? We bring glucose into a cell. We bring nutrition into the mitochondria, converted from food energy to cellular energy. And there's some exhaust, a little bit of free radicals that come as a consequence of that, just like your car has a little bit of exhaust. But the cool thing is inside the cell, we also have antioxidants that are generated to deal with the, with the free radicals, right? So oxidants and antioxidants. But if we have a cell running full tilt, full thyroid physiology, and full manufacturing process, and we're producing all this exhaust from the, from the mitochondria, plus we're producing exhaust from the threat that's there. You've got massive amounts of free radicals, and we don't have enough antioxidants to deal with it. And so what would happen in that situation is you'd get cell damage and destruction and potentially death. That's not what the cells want to do. So they adaptively downregulate the mitochondria, and it looks like it's just a way to minimize the amount of free radicals so that we don't create this apoptosis and damage to the cells. So the thyroid allostasis circling back is just how your thyroid physiology adapts to the pressors, the stressors on the system. And another really quick analogy is look at people in countries where there's 
famine and starvation. They have many times a down regulation of their thyroid physiology, higher levels sometimes of Hashimoto's. Mm. And we could say, well, that's maybe that's maybe <clears throat> that's bad and we should treat it. And in some of these areas where they've treated people with thyroid medication, those areas, their conditions got worse, mm -hmm. not better. Why would they get worse? If you, have, if you don't have enough nutrition in the cell, do you want your metabolism running at full tilt or do you want to slow it down, right? So I just think if we came from two individual cells and created you guys, me, you, I just have a hard time believing one day your body, you woke up and your body went, man, I don't recognize that thyroid gland anymore, mm. right? I think I just need to destroy this stuff. I just don't think that's the way the physiology works. Mm. And when you do what we do, and you reduce stressors and improve um, and support healthy physiology, we see thyroid glands recover. We see better conversion. So a lot of these things that we say is that the body's out of control, the immune system's out of control, I just don't buy it. Hmm. Well, the feedback loops, it's just like you said, Jen, going back to school. Everyone learns that in basic physiology. It's compensatory mechanisms, it's feedback loops. So it makes perfect sense, but we lose sight of it. So it's so important. You bring and one up. of the things too, if you don't mind me adding, like when we think about those cells in danger, those cells that are under threat, they send out signaling molecules out into the bloodstream, right? We call them inflammatory chemicals. We call them DAMPs, damage associated molecular peptides, which is like pieces of the tissue, PAMPs, which are pieces of the pathogen we throw out there. And we think they're out there just to alert the, you know, the immune cells to say, hey, that's the tissue. Let's go help it. That's the critter. Let's go find it. But what's really interesting is that the thyroid gland has pattern rec recognition receptors for those same DAMPs and PAMPs. And we typically, we learned in school that it was the antibodies that were kind of chewing up and eating up the thyroid gland. And the reality is it doesn't really happen. It's the infiltrating lymphocytes, T cells that are going, at, T lymphocyte cells that are going in there that are creating most of the damage. And how did they get there? Well, the thyroid cells themselves sent the signaling molecules when those pattern recognition receptors bind to the thyroid cells. Mm. So does that sound like broken physiology mm. or does that sound like more adaptive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very yeah, interesting. Yeah. Well, you brought up Hashimoto's, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. B. Let's look at a more holistic um, uh, or just pull back and look at the holistic nature of it. Can you tell us, for example, how does the immune system and gut health impact the thyroid? Well, I think there's a lot lots of multiple me mechanisms there potentially, but there's a large percentage of the immune system surrounds the GI tract. There's direct lymph connections from the GI tract to the thyroid tissue. And so again, if there's, dis if there's dysregulation in the GI tract, if there's damps, if there's PAMPs, and those things are being released or inflammatory chemicals because of dysbiosis in the bowel, those are things that could initiate reduced conversion of T4 to T3 in that area. And then those damps, those PAMPs, those Inflammatory molecules could also be the things that start triggering some of the thyroiditis. As far as the thyroid gland, the thyroid gland is critical to so many aspects of GI function. We, we think about like motility, like really important there, but stomach acid production requires thyroid hormone, pancreatic enzyme production. So you need thyroid hormone to support it for, uh, bile flow, bile function, bile production, guess what you need? You need T3, right? So almost every aspect of GI physiology requires appropriate levels of thyroid hormone. And if you have a reduction of thyroid hormone, whether it's glandular or because of some type of cell stress response, it can affect every aspect of gut function and gut physiology. Makes sense. Yep. So and I, I want to talk about your book. So, you know, we're, we've gone over a lot already, Dr. B. So The Thyroid Debacle. I love the title of this book. Um, when you've been very granular since we started speaking today. So what are some key takeaways? If you were to think about bullet points, maybe more general takeaways from the book that you think would be beneficial for functional medicine practitioners and patients for that matter. Number one is don't start with the sexy stuff. <laughs> right? So... You, when you listen to podcasts, when you listen to posts, when you listen to a bunch of things, people are talking about uh, the sexy kind of shiny object, the organism, the toxin, right. the uh, this crazy diet that they that works for all thyroid people. Like it's 
those are sexy things and kid, they're like clickbait. But at the end of the day, what triggers excessive cell stress, cellular or tissue hypothyroidism, gl thyroiditis, glandular hypothyroidism is really at the foundation, it's the same things that trigger almost every condition. And that is poor lifestyle factors, poor dietary issues, excessive toxic load, simple things, poor breathing. Like I'm a classic mm. example of that. Mm. 10, I think, I think I'm up to 10 broken noses, deviated septum. Oof. Um, and if you don't breathe well, you're gonna create hypoxia. If you have hypoxia, especially at night, you're going to upregulate your sympathetic nervous system. You're gonna trigger inflammation. You're also gonna downregulate thyroid physiology. I mean, without oxygen, you're gonna, you're gonna, if you breathe improperly every night through your mouth, you're gonna be, you're gonna trigger over time more and more tissue, hypo tissue hypoxia, tissue hypothyroidism, slow your metabolism down and gain weight. So it's a lot of times we miss what's somebody's diet. Are they getting the right calories and macros? Are they, is, are they, do they have good habits the vast majority of the time? Mm -hmm. Is their, is their emotional life healthy, right? Is there a lot of trauma that's not being dealt with? Do they have bad relationships with their spouse? Are they unhappy with their life? Do they, do they, they don't get appropriate sleep? Like I'm another great example. I was living on four hours of sleep a night before I, I was overtraining, probably overstressed, good diet, exercised, but I was overtraining for, because of doing endurance sports and not breathing well, not sleeping well. So I was sleeping four hours a night, poor breathing through the whole night, overtraining to, you know, work company, you know, kids, coach, with all that stuff. And in time that catches up to you. Like what was the thing? There probably wasn't a thing. It was the load over time. And how do you fix it? I didn't fix my Hashimoto's by starting to take meds. I looked, I had to be honest with myself and say, okay, what's going on here? And Dr. Kelly and I talk about this in the, in the third part of the book, like all these, what we call fitness factors, start there. What's your diet look like? I don't know. Well, how about a whole, just start with something simple, a whole food based diet. Well, does it need to be keto? Does it need to be vegetarian? Like, how about like whole food, right? Don't get involved in the, in the diet religions. Uh, <laughs> and change a diet changes your gut biome, as you guys well know, right? Good or bad. Um, and different diets are good, good for different people at different times, times, but we spend way too much time arguing about which whole food diet is the better one instead of how about we just eat a whole food diet and limit the processed food. Start there. It's easy. It's free. It doesn't cost you a bunch. How about what's your sleep habits? What's your sleep behaviors? What's your respiration, right? What's your control of breath time? Like, how about we just start with all these foundational and fundamental things before we add supplements, before we do too many crazy tests, before we look for all these crazy organisms, how about we just look at the foundational things, which is mm. what functional medicine is supposed to be all about, right? Mm. And it, we got here because of diet and lifestyle stuff. The, the best way to get back to get back to health is not by 30 supplements a day, it's by improving our habits and our lifestyles. The supplements are a tool to help us get there at times, but they're, you can't out supplement bad diet, bad lifestyle, bad behavior, bad thoughts. Right. Well put. Yeah. And you, you touched on um, some lifestyle habits, um, Dr. B, but I'm curious, you know, you talked about food, um, you talked about sleep, how important that is. You did mention, um, you know, mental and emotional well-being. Is there anything you can suggest? I'm just curious, too, from your personal life, do you do things like meditation or journaling? What do you do for emotional and mental health? You know what? I've done all of those things. And some of those things work. Some things don't uh, for me. But what, one of the things that's most important to me is really quiet time. And it's, it's meditation. Um, but it's not like an organized meditation where I'm like, okay, I'm going to sit in the middle of the floor. I'm going <laughs> to, you know, have my little smoke going and do whatever, but it's just quiet time, time away. I spend a lot of time these now in, in the woods and I can, in that quiet time, no cell phone to stare at and just time, time with myself helps me kind of work through a bunch of things. In the book, I, I give lots of suggestions. I do like the idea of of writing out, um, 
to me, you know, there's some schools where you just write all your beliefs and just write them over and over and over again, and they'll come to life. Well, not always, hmm. right? And sometimes you're, as you're writing those things, you don't believe those things. And so now you're creating a false, um, kind of a falsehood or a lie in your brain. But I think it's really, I think for me, one of the biggest life lessons to help with the emotional stress is to live in the present, not worry about the past, not worry, worry about the future. Uh, too many of us carry like life's past around like a weighted backpack, like a rucksack or something. And, you know, then we're wondering why we're so tired and fatigued because I've, I've got all this stuff I'm carrying with me. And I'm a firm believer today that you just, you just have to live in the moment. And two, if I can't change it, I don't really need to worry about it. Something, and I don't really don't think that the vast majority of us make a lot of bad decisions unless we don't learn from those things that we do. Hmm. So I try and make decisions fairly quickly. 50% of the time, I think I'm going to be right. 50% of the time, mm-hmm. I'm going to be wrong. Pretty so able. just make a decision and do it. Yeah. But learn from those mistakes and you know, watch that stinking thinking that's going in your, on, on in your mind because that's really one of the biggest stressors is what, what goes on between the six inches of your ears, right? <laughs> I think w- women, I, no offense, it, I think it's in the literature, the women have, have a tendency to say a lot more to themselves in a given day than men. Mm-hmm. Like when you ask uh, a man, like, what are they thinking about? They say nothing. They're probably thinking <laughs> about nothing, right? True. Um, but for women, there's a lot going on in, in that mind and there's a lot of conversation going on, sometimes not all good and sometimes we're our own worst enemy. But there's a couple th- things that I like. I like heart math as a tool. Uh, when I, when somebody recommended heart math to me, uh, I, was, I was like, this thing stinks. It doesn't work. Can't get, and they're like, well, why can't you get it to work? I'm like, it never goes into the zone, like the color scheme it's supposed to. Mm. They're like, well, what are you thinking about when you're doing it? I'm like, I'm thinking about all the stuff I got to do. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, they're like, that's why. How about think, just focus on that. And once I got that down, I was like, okay, that helped me with, oh, I got to clear my mind. Yeah. Um, and then today there's a little wearable device I really like. I use it. I have, I recommend it a lot to my clients called the Apollo Neuro device. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but it's a wearable. And for a lot of my clients who have high stress, anxiousness, anxiety, sleep disruption, it really helps kind of calm them down. They don't have to sit and do breathing meditation. They don't have to do something else because they're already stressed beyond belief. It's just a device you can put on. It puts vibration into the, into the tissue and you could set it. Do I need to calm? Do I need, do I need something for calming, for anxiety, for focus, for attention, for sleep? And it puts vibration into the tissue, probably changes some of that brainwave physiology. And it has a really nice effect for a lot of people. And so it's tough because we tell people a lot of times, like you need to spend five or 10 minutes like meditating, or you need to 10, take 10 minutes to journal or do your, do your after action report at night. And they're already overwhelmed. Mm. Right. And they're like, I don't have time for it. Yeah. But if we can find some tools like that, that they can just, it helps guide them. They can do it when, without even knowing they're doing it, doing it. And we can get them to a place of more peace and more calm than some of those other things like getting out in nature and, spending more quiet time, not sitting in front of the TV, breathing, um, doing some, some type of meditation, it gets easier because everybody that I'm not sure, well, I'm not sure about you guys, but almost everybody, you know, that we, I talked to is already overwhelmed and now you're going to give them more stuff yeah. to do. And they're like, it doesn't work. Well, of course yeah. it doesn't work. Right. Such so a good point. I, simple strategies. A lot, and we put a bunch of them in there, but, uh, in the book, but it, it's simple stuff, but I think uh, to a large degree, really being aware of what you're thinking about and what's going on in the mind. And I think too many of us are too busy looking at this stuff and looking at other stuff that we're not aware of what's going on in, in our own mind. I, I had a friend of mine say, how can you sit out in the woods for six to eight hours? That would drive me crazy. I'm like, if you can't do it, mm-hmm. you need to do it. That's a sign. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. And so <laughs> it's the one of the most peaceful things, but it's not comfortable in the beginning because you're like, okay, where's my, what am I going to do out here? What am I going to do? Do I have, you know, can I listen to a book? Can I, can I do like a word game? Yeah. But when you really get comfortable with yourself and the thoughts going through your mind, 
it's not necessarily like a meditation, but it is, you are doing a form of meditation when you're alone with yourself and your thoughts and you can really start to process these things that keep kind of flooding in that we're kind of maybe in the subconscious now become conscious. And you're like, man, why would I think that? Why would I think those things? Why would I have those beliefs? And I think that's the best way many times to get right with yourself. I love it. It's beautiful. So inspiring. Lots of wisdom there. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've read that all this stuff on the back of like a matchbook or something. <laughs> there you go. Well, there, I'm really loving where this conversation has headed and I want to pull on that a bit more. Where do you think, Dr. B, the future of thyroid wellness and care in the realm of functional medicine is headed or where do you hope that it's headed? What do you see? Well, I've said I wrote a book because I want more people to think, do something different. I think the challenge in, I'm, I love that more people are coming to functional medicine. Um, I think it's great. However, I think to some degree we have to guard the gates because we have too many people coming into functional medicine, but still applying an allopathic philosophy. Yeah. They're like medication bad. I'm just going to use different drugs because they're more close to what the body has, or I'm going to use lots of supplements to do the same thing and they're natural and it's better. I think we have to, I think that we're going to improve people's health and well being and do a better job if we're not racing in trying to optimize somebody's lab values with medications. I'm hoping people will read the book. And if you guys read the book, it's the premise is about thyroid physiology, but it really isn't about thyroid physiology. It's really about understanding that a lot of what happens is, is at a cellular level, cellular stress, how do we reduce the stress and reduce the stress? Not only does thyroid physiology work better, blood sugar physiology works better, lipids run, you know, everything can start to normalize on its own. Mm -hmm. And so I think the future of functional medicine for thyroid physiology isn't looking at a client who doesn't feel good and saying, oh, that doctor was silly. They only ran TSH and free T4. I'm doing a better job because I'm looking at free T3 and reverse T3 and the antibodies, and I'm giving you T4 and T3 because I'm going to optimize your blood and saying, oh, wait a minute, when that doesn't work, now I'll just do T3 and I'll just start jacking T3 up really high because oh, you, obviously you can't utilize T4. Like, how do you think this person got through 30 or 40 years of their life with on T4 and T3? It didn't, the switch didn't break and they can only use T3. We'll start, we'll stop trying to manipulate and really start investigating and asking what's causing the body to behave this way and start addressing truly the root issues that are impacting people. And it's usually not a thing, but a load of things. Mm. And yeah, could it be organisms, could it be toxins, could it be, you know, these, you know, all these kind of flashy things that are out there? Sure. But let's do all the foundational things. And if it's still not quite right, then, then I think it makes sense to look for all the flashy things. So well said. Well, I got to hear a case, Dr. B. What's a case in, that comes to mind that really has stuck with you and you find inspiring applying these tools? Well, for me, it's like every, every client that I work with is, is uh, an inspiring case and, and the principles apply, but I've got plenty of patients that have been told that they, their thyroid gland can't recover. You're going to have to take this medication over and over forever. again uh, and forever. And within a year, they're off medication. They're doing right. Everything is normal. A couple of things I think are really important is, and it's some of the tougher cases, and it's the people that have not just struggled in allopathic medicine, but have struggled in the functional medicine model and have done, have gone the way of high T4, T4, T3 high T4, high T3, or high T3 only, and are still struggling. They're still really struggling. And these are the, sometimes the hardest clients to deal with because taking them off of the T3 and trying to get those medications appropriate is sometimes like getting somebody off crack, right? They're addicted. They don't feel good without it. They don't feel good with it. And so you have to step them down and getting them, because they... 
these are some of the most hopeless people when they come see me because they think they've done everything and they've done everything right. And they've been optimized by somebody and, uh, and getting them feeling and function better is awesome. But I'll tell you a, a really interesting story is that I have a, a client who's uh, in the fitness world, been getting optimized with T4 and T3 and up, up back and forth of those and then hormone replacement therapy, right? It just feels awful. And at one point I was just like, look, you're, I typically don't work on top of other functional medicine practitioners at all, but this, her integrative practitioner kept doing things. And I kept saying, listen, I, I don't think I can help you if you continue to take this up. I don't think you should be on it. I don't think it's a mess. It's, I think this is the big challenge is you're trying to fix a problem that may not exist at all mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. And we've done a lot of work. We worked on the dietary stuff and lifestyle stuff and looked at her, her GI tract did a gut zoom. Like we did a lot of this stuff to try and get her better. But I'm like, your medications and these sup these additional supplements are the problem at this point. And so we had that kind of come to Jesus conversation where I was like, listen, I'm more than happy to help you, but I think you're wasting your time and money because you, you asked me for advice. I give it to you. Then you, this other person gives you a bunch of stuff. And I, and I would, I would lay out the mechanism of action of how that's all occurring for her. And finally, she's like, all right, whatever. So 30 days, no hormones, no bioidentical hormones, no thyroid hormone. I said, we're going to rerun the full panel and we're going to see what it shows. Everything's perfect. Hor hormones are normal. Thyroid hormones are normal. Inflammatory markers are good. Blood sugar's back to normal. And how did she feel? Like, she felt fine. Uh, yeah. Wow. She's like, I, I feel good. No supplements, <laughs> no medications, no nothing. It's a right? miracle. So, <laughs> so the issue, and the issue is, that sometimes the physician or the client feels they have to take something to fix themselves. And the stuff we do may make sense sometimes initially, but in time is the problem. Yeah. And so that was a really cool story. And maybe one other one quick is a, is a woman who had thyroid, had, had a thyroidectomy on thyroid medication, felt terrible, came to see me. We did all the stuff I, I talk about in the book. And over time, we had to keep weaning down. Like every 30 days, we're decreasing the dose of thyroid medicine, decreased the dose. Now, this is a person who doesn't have a thyroid gland. And so um, there's no medication. She's doing good. Lab's good. Feels good. Function's good. Lab panels are good. I'm like, she's like, how can it be? I'm like, well, the thyroid gland has the ability to regenerate. I wouldn't be surprised if your thyroid gland is regenerated. She's like, my doctor said that's impossible. I'm like, I, ask them how, how you can have thyroid hormone then, right? How is it possible? And so anyway, they went and they did an ultrasound of her thyroid gland. And guess what? Half of that thyroid gland had grown back in the course of... Whoa. Um, that's amazing. What did her doc say? We're taking it back out. Oh my gosh. And she said, no way. So she's still doing good. It's like, it's, I think it's been a year and a half since with that is gone. She's still not on thyroid medication, still doing wow. good. But this is the, like we tell people that the thyroid gland can't recover your thyroid hormone for the rest of your life. If you do the right things, you may not. It may take time for that thyroid gland to recover, but you can recover. But you'll never recover if you're taking excessive amounts of thyroid hormone and driving down the need for the thyroid gland to actually ever have to do work. And it's never going to recover if you have, don't address the things that drew, drew, drove the thyroiditis to begin with. But if you come to functional medicine or you go to, I think if you come to see somebody that's practicing functional medicine the way I think it should be practiced, then I think it's absolutely possible that you'll need less medication. It can work better and you may not in time not need it at all. Amazing. You've given us a lot to think on and chew on. Dr. B. And I have not read your book yet, but I can sincerely say I want to now. Um, <laughs> and I don't always say that. <laughs> I don't. So, um, wow. You, and you've really taken us to school. So we're going to wrap it up. And I want to thank you so much for being here. We talked about thyroid physiology, getting back to that balance, thyroid allostasis, cellular hypothyroidism, these things that we don't talk about nearly enough. And I want to learn more about um, 
and I'm sure I can do that with the book that you wrote. Um, so before we say goodbye, let's learn about you a little bit more personally um, with our three rapid fire questions. Are you game? I'm ready. Awesome. Right. You take it away, Jen. Okay. Dr. B, you're on a deserted island, food and water's taken care of. What are, I'm going to give you two things, two things that you'd take with you. Uh, one of them would be my wife. <laughs> I always say, if she leaves me, I'm going with her. <laughs> so <laughs> if I, if I left her, I'd want her to come with me. Um, and the other thing I would want to take with me is what would I also I take with me? What about Maybe a pair of, sh maybe a nice pair of shorts just to walk around in. So I don't want to be like one of those, well, you know, one of those people that's, you know, you don't want to be they making those the TV shorts shows. out of a loincloth, big, big plants. And... I don't want to be, yeah, I don't want to be naked and afraid. I don't want to be, yeah, I don't want to do that. So yeah, that, that would be too soon. Maybe a nice pair of shorts that I can wear a lot and I'll take my bride with me. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Afraid and comfortable. Or not so afraid because you're used to being out. Of <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I got my wife. I got my shorts. I'm good to go. Yeah. <laughs> I think I can figure almost everything out because there's got to be something to eat there, right? There's fish. I, I think we'll be good. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I have every confidence in you. All right. <laughs> um, if you could travel to any destination in the world for a dream vacation, where would you go and why? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question. If you asked me this maybe two or three, eh, maybe six years ago, I would have said, Peru and Machu Picchu, that was mm. on my bucket list. Right now, I really wouldn't go to Iceland. That's on my bucket list. That's where I want to go. Uh, I just think the country is beautiful. I'd like to see it both summer, winter. Uh, I love hiking, love being out in nature. Uh, so that would be probably tops on my list. Beautiful. Nice. All right. Last one. Give us a book, not your own and not one in your field, um, <laughs> that's made a profound impact on your life and the way you think. Easy. It's a book called The One Thing. Have you guys read that? No. I've heard of that. Tell me about it. All right. So it's a very simple book. It's called The One Thing. It's a funny story. My buddy Ben Lynch uh, was saying, I was doing all this stuff. He's like, Eric, you need to do, you need to read this book called The One Thing. And I was so like, all right, whatever. Uh, so I'm flying to a conference. I was speaking first thing in the morning. I read the book on the flight down, piece of cake. I get up in the morning. I'm a, a to go for a run. It's dark out, Florida, hot, humid. I figure it's a five mile run. Um, and I go for the run. I got my headphones on. And my buddy had called me before we, uh, on the, the night before and said his wife was leaving him. So I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about things back home, doing all that stuff. And I'm running and I didn't bring any water because it's just going to be a five mile run, right? I'll be, I'll be right back. And I realize I don't know where I'm at. And so in that moment, I'm like, wait a minute, I just read <laughs> the one thing on the flight down. And here I am, I'm running, I've got a podcast on, I'm thinking about my friend, I'm thinking about other things at home. I'm not doing one thing. I'm doing five things in my head like I always do. And in that moment, I was like, the one thing, what's my one thing I need to get done? And that's, I need to get home. And so or I need to get back to the hotel. So that it led me on this journey. It turned out to be about a 11 and a half mile run, but I finally got back there in time for the conference. But I started the conference with that story yeah. and that book, The wow. One Thing. But I use that all the time to say, it's not that you can only do one thing, but we, in today's world, everybody thinks they can multitask mm -hmm. and you can't do a lot of things well at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so I think this, one of the, this goes back to reducing stress. Don't try and do two or three things at the same time. Don't try and do so, you know, watch a video or listen to this and do that and do this. One thing, do one thing. If, if, if the podcast is what we're doing right now, then we're doing the podcast. We're not looking at emails. We're not doing anything else. i texting my wife. We're not doing any of the other stuff. We're just focused on the thing. If I'm with my wife, I'm going to do that one thing. I want to be with her, mm -hmm. right? If I'm watching a game, hon, I'm watching a game. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I'm doing the one thing. Yeah. But I think that book, it's short, it's quick, it's fast. And I, I recommend that book all the time. That would be my book. All right. Perfect. What, a, what an awesome way to end. Um, Dr. B, it's been an absolute pleasure. Let the listeners know where they can find you. Your website, are you on Instagram or are you dancing on TikTok? Let us know where we can find you. I, like I said, I'm not a great dancer, right? So <laughs> I'm not a TikToker. Uh, I... Uh, my website is rejuvagencenter.com. So you can find us up there. 
I have a podcast called Thyroid Answers Podcast. Um, and uh, that's great. It's not about, it, it is about thyroid physiology, but it's really about this whole idea, this whole concept, cell stress, and what can we do to change um, our own physiology and get healthy and get well and answer those questions that people have. So that, that podcast is out there. It's on all the platforms. Uh, I am on social media. I'm not a great social media person. So I do have some people that help get that stuff out for me. And I, 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 if I'm going to look at anything social media, it's probably going to be Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, but I do put a lot of Thyroid Thursday videos out. So it's probably every Thursday, I put a longer form educational video. I guess some people like them. Some people don't. Some people want the dancing TikTok person <laughs> to push, push poking a caption. It's over. But really, my, <laughs> my stuff is really about like, I'll break down a lab panel, right? Like here's the thyroid panel. Here's what it tells me. Here's what I would be thinking along the way. Or I want to, I really wanted to use those 10 minute spots just to educate people about stuff. Mm -hmm. Should you take vitamin D? Well, let me, let's talk about vitamin D. Here's what I have to say about vitamin D. It may be different than what you're used to. What about your iron physiology? I, they're not super crazy fun, but they're very educational. At least I try and make them educational. Um, so Instagram, Thyroid Thursdays on YouTube and on Instagram. And the podcast is out there, YouTube and on all those platforms. So those are the places to get me. And of course, Dr. Kelly and I have the book, The Thyroid Debacle. And we even, uh, on my website, we have a, a course for clinicians uh, based on the book. Fantastic. Well, we will make sure we've got all of those links in the show notes. So if you're listening, um, make sure to check those out. And until next time, everybody, stay vibrant. Thanks, Dr. B. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here today. Don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe so we can continue to pay it forward together. And remember, the key to longevity is knowledge. Keep learning, growing, and tuning in to the Vibrant Wellness Podcast to discover the latest insights and strategies for optimal health. Join us again next week. Just a reminder, this podcast is for educational and informational purposes and is not a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The views expressed by guests and hosts are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy of Vibrant Wellness. As always, consult your healthcare provider before applying any recommendations that you heard here today.